Dr. Johannes Klaus. Johannes Klaus received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the Technical University in Munich, Germany. He studied electrical engineering in Munich and Barcelona. He is currently doing his postdoctoral research at the Hans Nixdorf Institute for Medical Electronics at Technical University in Munich. In 2006, he co-founded the company Sense Inside, a healthcare high-tech startup which developed and launched an intelligent tooth sprint for the treatment of teeth grinding. His current research interests are active implantable devices and portable miniaturized medical devices. Dr. Klaus has a very interesting and timely talk for us today. The title of his talk is Mobile Devices for Better Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johannes Klaus. Today it's still it's still like that. Somebody comes at home 
uh, to these people and measuring, for example, the blood pressure, which is uh, working automatically. So this is the picture today still. Uh, the patient is at home, so he's measuring with a very simple device. Uh, perhaps he has a own blood pressure meter and he calls the doctor, the doctor comes, or uh, you're moving to a doctor's office. So if he comes because uh, uh, this is a picture of Europe, I, I think it's, it's the same in many other parts of the world, uh, yet we don't have enough doctors in all the places. And uh, additionally, if we had uh, enough doctors uh, in all places, that produces very high costs in the whole system. So if we take a look to the, to the costs uh, shown here, it's shown where the money costs uh, goes. <coughs> the, the biggest costs are the, the care giving services and uh, additionally the pharmaceutical costs. Especially these costs you can lower a lot uh, with the use of, of electronics like I, I want to show uh, afterwards. But what is uh, for me very important is that we don't just want to lower the costs. Uh, that is a statement of a, of a chairman of, of AXA, that's a big uh, German health insurance. He, he said, more medicine is not more health. I, I don't think that we, we need more, more medicine, that we need more, more effort on that. We need a better medicine, we need to improve medicine. So it's, it's not about, only about costs lowering the costs. It's nice to, to, to lower the costs, but I think it's much more important to improve the quality of the, the use of, of electronics in healthcare. So what, what do we need in fact? In fact, uh, we need like mobile devices, uh, we need a kind of a doctor in the back, so medical assistance everywhere you are at any time, and just uh, a doctor to put, to put in, your, in, your, in your pocket. It's not always only about the technology. We, have, we need a strong emancipation from these proprietary structures that, that we have now. We, we need to put many of the proprietary knowledge that doctors have at the moment in shared databases, for example. We need expert system in databases. And I think you can compare this development that we need in, in, in healthcare definitely now a bit to, to uh, consumer electronics as well. Then you had the step from the television, which it was one way just to, to the people, uh, to the internet, which is completely interactive. So we need this uh, interactive structure in, in healthcare as well, in my opinion. So I want to show you today some, uh, some projects uh, uh, that demonstrate how electronics could uh, be used to improve uh, in future the, our life. And, and uh, the main topic of this conference is consumer electronics. I will focus on uh, well, not only consumer electronics, but uh, next generation mobility. I want to focus a bit on uh, the mobile products like uh, telemonitoring, for example. And on that field, uh, you could have seen many things in, in, uh, in the CES as well, like uh, many, many telemonitoring uh, solutions. And uh, I want to show you some, uh, just as an example, our system, which is called Comus, that we built uh, on our institute in Munich. But there are many other uh, things like that in industry and in research. And uh, just introducing a bit this, this platform, you have a, a set of, uh, of sensors, of medical sensors, of mobile medical sensors that are connected via a smartphone to a database which is located in, in the internet. And uh, to this data, the patient can, can see it, the, the doctor can see it, uh, the medical call center, for example, can see it. And uh, the database is, is, is quite important, that's why it's big thing here because it's not only a database, it should be an expert system, so it should be able to, to decide on, on its own and just put the data that comes from the patient, give advice to the patient without needing always a doctor. You need the doctor, but you don't need it always. But the, the work at all is, is too much for the doctors at the moment. And what is, what is quite important, you always have this feedback loop either from the doctor or from the database to the, to the patient to give him advice, to give him motivation. Motivation is one of the most important things in, in healthcare, especially in prevention and rehabilitation as well. So that sounds uh, at the first look a bit uh, complicated, but uh, as we know that many elderly people will use these systems, it's uh, quite important to keep them very, very simple. And that's what we in healthcare learned a lot, I think, from, from consumer electronics as well, uh, to keep these systems extremely simple. And we tried to, to have an approach to uh, just 
design a device with one touch. You just do one button on the on the medical device, a wireless Bluetooth, uh, wireless blood pressure meter, for example. You just press there, and then the data is transmitted automatically to the phone, and from the phone automatically to the database, and you don't have to care about nothing. So that's uh, that's the way uh, to do it. To, 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 uh, yeah, make it easy to the people. If you want, you can for sure see your data on, I don't know, on a PC, on a tablet, on a smartphone, and analyze this data yourself if you are one way to do that. And uh, once more, it's very, it's very important to keep that simple and to, to, to uh, yeah, to that people can use everything they, they have yet. People are not pleased if you just say to them, please take the iPhone to, to control your data, please take that phone to control your data, please take that television to control your data. They just want to use the, uh, the things that are familiar with. Uh, we cannot force them to use special devices, so you have to support every device, every uh, operating system. So the first uh, thing I want to look at is, is hypertension. As a, as a first example, because uh, hypertension is an area with a very high uh, potential for telemedicine. Uh, for example, you have this uh, so-called white coat effect in, in hypertension. If you are at the doctor's office and you measure your blood pressure, you're more excited, and then the blood pressure is naturally higher than if you measure it at home. And uh, that obviously causes wrong medication because the doctor thinks your blood pressure is higher. You have a lot of, a lot of effects. Uh, in there. So the, that system, as mentioned before, just works with a, with a blood pressure meter uh, that is connected wirelessly to a mobile phone, and the mobile phone transmits the data to the internet database where it uh, can be shown and where uh, you can give the feedback to the user as well. So just uh, to give an example why that makes uh, a lot of sense, what you see on the on the left side is kind of the, the traditional doctor-patient uh, relationship just uh, yeah, come to the doctor's office every two or three or, or six months and uh, if you're at the doctor's office the doctor will give you an advice for, for medication for example for uh, improve your life uh, please take healthier food please do more activity uh, in your life and uh, then you leave the doctor's office and, and actually you think okay I'm, I'm gonna be back in the doctor's office in I don't know, two or three months perhaps with the, with the activity I can start tomorrow and uh, so compliance is going down normally, and uh, the course of the blood pressure is going is going up at the same time because the people don't take their medicine, they don't do uh, activity, nothing. And just before they come back to the doctor's office, they think, oh, next week I have to go to the doctor's office. Better I take my pills now uh, because the doctor will register that I don't do. So that that's what's going to happen. And uh, with the telemedicine, we we hope that uh, the, the the situation is. is uh, going better uh, because you measure often and you don't measure for your own, you know that the data is, is being sent to a database and possibly your doctor uh, will see that data and then you're quite motivated to keep the compliance high and uh, the course of the blood pressure is going down. And that was uh, not only an example but that was shown in some studies before so that, that really works. The second thing is uh, rehabilitation, because the main the main reason for uh, for the high blood pressure is obesity is uh, is unsuff uh, insufficient uh, exercise, and uh, to ch change that you have to change the life of the people, you have to change the behavior of the people. But today you spend like two to three weeks in a rehabilitation clinic, and that's not enough. You need about like 90 to 100, uh, 180 days to change behavior of the people. And uh, so you see the, the, the most important thing is to keep the motivation of the people high. That's what could be done with the with, uh, telematic systems, that they, they just contribute to their, to their uh, therapy. So that's why telemedicine is the uh, yeah, help doctors and, and patients in the same, in the same moment. Uh, it's very comfortable for the patient and for the doctor. You have an objective documentation uh, and you have a lot of high a lot higher motivation for the patient. That's what can be seen in all studies. It's, it's very hard to show that telemedicine uh, lowers the cost in the, in the, uh, the poor healthcare system. That's very hard to show because there are many long-term eff 
text that I, I can avoid some of the harder text on stroke. Uh, while, while it's really easy to show that the motivation of the patient uh, goes, goes out. Second example I want to show is about respiratory diseases because they are uh, increasing a lot and uh, are kind of a, yeah, very widespread diseases now. Uh, during the last 10 years, uh, the number of mathematics in Western Europe, for example, has, has doubled and it's the most frequent chronic disease among children. So, a company that uh, is a spin-off of our institute, they developed a mobile spirometer that is uh, specifically made for, for children. It's very easy to handle for children and the measurement is quite uh, reliable for uh, uh, the very small lungs of the, of the children, the very small lung capacity. And uh, that is once more connected via a smartphone to a, to a database where, where doctors can, can see that. And uh, especially that, that makes sense if you if you connect uh, uh, interlinked to the system, because uh, if you monitor uh, or if you do diagnostics here, you can monitor the, the, the therapy as well with this interlinker, which is connected to the database uh, as well. And you can give uh, the people that much medicine they need according to the diagnostics that you have before, and that's not only interesting for. Uh, for only uh, respiratory diseases, that's very interesting for, for many diseases because it's quite a big trend in, in uh, pharmacology at the moment, in pharma industry, in, in, that uh, you have many medicines inhalable, you have uh, insulin, and you have antibiotics inhalable, and that's a big, uh, a big advantage, especially for older people because uh, the gastrointestinal uh, passage have often many side effects like, uh, like problems with the, with the stomach. And the bioavailability of, of, uh, of inhalable medicine is a lot, a lot uh, better than uh, with the lung, uh, sorry, with the inhalable medicine uh, to, the, to the intestinal passage. So we did uh, other approaches as well, uh, like glucose devices, uh, that not only us, but uh, this uh, glucose monitoring form of LG is yet, I think, eight or or something years old, uh, they built a phone uh, where you can put your measurement stripe directly in. Uh, they only sold it in, in, in Korea, not in, not in Europe, I don't know about the US, uh, but there are many, many of these, uh, of these devices coming, like ECG devices, you have several uh, things. That one was shown here on, on CES first, one of, of iHealth, I think, uh, to monitor uh, for cardiac diseases, for example. Another application is, uh, is are the consequences of falling. Uh, in the statistics you can see that, that falling is very common for, for people over 75 and uh, the, the consequences of, of falling are always crucial for the need of, of nurse care, and, which makes it very expensive because most nurse care is very expensive. And uh, the falling mainly occurs due dizziness of the people. So we're all getting how to offend that? Uh, you can offend it with, uh, or measure that with some some sensors that are still on the market, like uh, like accelerometers with intelligent shoe soles. You have so many devices here on the CES that are, are doing just that, but they are mostly used for for fitness purposes at the moment. Uh, activity sensors, for example. But with these sensors, you can uh, get uh, individual gait patterns of these people. You can differ between gait patterns that are normal and gait patterns that are related to dizziness of the people. So if you can differ them, you can do a warning. You can just uh, ring your phone and, and say to people, please sit down, you're getting dizzy. And so you avoid the falling with the last consequence. So all these uh, systems can be used to, to generate feedback. And that's quite uh, important because uh, the feedback to the patient keeps the motivation high. As I, as I told you before, the motivation, in my opinion, is one of the yeah, most important things uh, in prevention and in rehabilitation as well. So normally it's like that. The patient is uh, measuring with his uh, mobile sensors and the data is going to the database, possibly a doctor or a clinic or perhaps a call center is looking to the data and then it's going to a, to a feedback management system and the feedback comes back 
to the patient that can be a voice channel, that can be a, a data. Uh, just to give an example, that uh, it could be uh, why don't you purchase your uh, uh, why don't you do your purchase on foot today because that's uh, that's healthier. But and as well, you can warn the people uh, that they are using special medicine that has some side effects uh, that are uh, related to uh, that I have to go to the toilet very often. Uh, just uh, to give the people some uh, some extra information. Another possibility is uh, is lowering the blood pressure uh, through music. We did a lot of uh, research about that at our institute. My colleague uh, Peter Friedrich did that, and that's quite interesting because that's significantly possible. So he, he's measuring his blood pressure. He sees it's high. He's a bit uh, frustrated. Data is going to the database, and that automatically does a, a feedback with the uh, very relaxing music and then uh, the blood pressure is lowering. You can show that very very clearly if you, if you do that with, with test uh, patients that work. Really so actually we uh, saw that these systems has a lot of advantages like uh, like a higher motivation, like a patient autonomy, like, like safety. Uh, more safety for the patient, but uh, we have to look at the, the disadvantages as well. So the, the systems that are there today, they yeah, they're, they're quite big. You have various devices to, to wear. So if you have uh, various uh, illnesses, various diseases, you have to carry a lot, uh, a whole suitcase with you. Uh, and, and if elderly people, for example, want to to be mobile. Uh, when they're getting old, you, you cannot uh, give them a whole suitcase to, to carry all the day or everywhere they go. Second thing is that you have a, a quite complicated uh, handling of, of, of all that. Uh, if you have like four to five devices, you have four to five user manuals, you have to, uh, to, to handle uh, all these devices. Uh, third thing is the stigmatization. So if you're just on a train or so somewhere while, while eating, you, you, you want to just do a short measure on your on your health, and you open your, your suitcase, all the people, they will think, wow, he must be ill if he's carrying the whole hospital in a suitcase with him. Uh, so we thought a, a bit, and uh, our aim was, was to develop a device called all-in-one medical device, which is measuring a wide range of these, of these parameters as a very compact device. I don't know, the size of a smartphone with a big screen and, and the data transmission automatically via, via internet like, like the other systems but all in one, one single device. So that's the first prototype that we just presented in, in December on a, a congress in, in Germany. Uh, you just put your finger inside here, you just put it through there and uh, you start the me me measurement with a green button that's a, a touch screen here. You can uh, measure the blood pressure, ECG, uh, the pulse, the oxygen saturation, the blood uh, glucose via test strip and uh, the temperature, and the weight is connected uh, as well via Bluetooth. Obviously, it's not possible to do the weight with that device. Again, here uh, a very simple user face, uh, user interface is uh, very important. So, to do it with uh, just one touch. With just one green button, you have to insert your finger, press the green button, and then everything happens. It's transmitted to the database automatically. You don't have to do anything else. We just added a feature for uh, emergency calling. If you if you are falling down with that device, the device is registering because it has a, a motion sensor and is automatically uh, calling the emergency. If you're staying on the ground, uh, you can do a, a manual emergency call as well and you can do of course any analysis on your data if you want to so it's kind of an expert mode uh, there to do it, uh, a special a special uh, analysis on so what's going to be next in, in our eyes uh, the next aim would be to, to place all these devices we have now in this uh, smartphone uh, smartphone device uh, just to put them in a small finger ring can wear every day just just on your finger without disturbing uh, you just wear every day without any any disturbance so data will be transmitted the same way, way via your smartphone to the to the internet
challenge. That's in development, but that's the main problem about that is, is the is the powering, like we heard before. Uh, the powering always yeah, is, is, is one of the biggest problems. So what's going to be after that? Uh, I was uh, quite surprised seeing that uh, some time ago. I think I think 20 years ago, nobody of us could imagine that, that implants are going to consumer electronics, but it's yet it's yet present. Like that's that's 10 years ago, and, and when I studied in Barcelona, uh, a club and I club started to uh, to put these RFID tags. Uh, just into your arm, just for like good people to use that as uh, the ticket to the club and to pay at the, the bar. For me, it's quite surprising that people do, but they they definitely do. I'm, I'm quite sure that they they did that in Las Vegas before before Barcelona. I don't know, but, but I'm quite sure. So yeah, weird, but 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 present. Uh, I don't want to talk about about these implants more, but about uh, healthcare, healthcare implants a bit, or in-body devices. So uh, the first project I want to show you is another feedback system that we that we built, and it's an, an intelligent tooth splint for the diagnosis and therapy of teeth grinding or, or bruxism. And the bruxism is quite uh, widespread; about eight to ten percent of the of the population in the, in the Western countries are are. Uh, of bruxism and it's mainly related to mental stress. So what we did is we did a, a small microsystem which you can place in a tooth splint, seen uh, below here, uh, because these tooth splints the people anyway have to wear. They have to wear it just to protect their, their teeth. And uh, this microsystem can measure the, the activity of the teeth and transmits it to the second part to a small receiver system which can store the data and transmit it to a, uh, to a computer to analyze the data. I will show that afterwards. And the second thing is the receiver is capable to give a, a feedback to the, to the user. So just if you grind with your teeth, you get a direct feedback, a biofeedback, uh, which is just doing over a long time a uh, so-called condition with the, with the patient. Just to give a, a small example how that uh, how that works actually, the graph you see uh, the frequency of teeth grinding every night, and every every blue bar is, is, is one night, and uh, you can see clearly that you have some, some peaks here, and uh, if you take a closer look, uh, these peaks are always at the end of the month. So after speaking with the patient, it turned out that he was a controller uh, and had a lot of stress in his, in his job at this time and uh, yeah we, we gave him this biofeedback therapy in combination with a psychological uh, therapy and you can see that in the next month it, it was much better so that so the device is very good for monitoring uh, the therapy as well so that was a kind of a starting point for us for for a platform building a platform for intelligent implants and our idea was to, to connect them to the, to the COMIS system as well. And the main idea of this, of this platform was uh, just to build many devices uh, with the same platform technology to, just to keep uh, the, the extra corporate unit, uh, which was with, with that device here, just to keep uh, the, the connection to the, to the computer and just to keep many things of the implant, just to change the center. Uh, and the actor, so we built some other implants with this uh, with this platform as well. So just one I, uh, I would like to show you today, uh, the, the very last example I'm going to show you. Uh, that implant, uh, or the idea of that implant is to measure the, the activity of the tumor. So whether whether a tumor is growing in the moment or, or not, and that is quite interesting because uh, we know that uh, our chemotherapy or radiation therapy is only working when the tumor is growing. And uh, how, how's the implant doing that? He's uh, just measuring the, the oxygen uh, saturation in the surroundings of the tumor. As the oxygen saturation is lowering, the tumor is growing. So the idea of the implant is a, is a, is a feedback, it's a closed loop device. So uh, we're just measuring the, the oxygen. If the oxygen is lowering, we just can give uh, chemotherapeutic medicine just directly to the tumor locally. That was the, the main idea of that. 
So what you can see here is that uh, many, or that the whole body is, is just a, a system of embedded uh, electrical subsystems. Uh, there are many, many things in our body that, that are working electronically. That's why electronics is always, a, or in many cases, a good uh, solution uh, for implants. And uh, there are a lot of applications uh, that are solved yet. I, I don't want to go very deep into that, in that but everybody knows uh, the, the pacemaker, for example, which is completely electronic. Uh, that's the first one from uh, more than 50 years ago now. Uh, the cochlear implant, for example, that is uh, just uh, done in the early 70s, a long time ago, which is stimulating the acoustic nerve. Same with the, with the retina implant, which is stimulating the optical nerve, which is quite near to the market now, so the, the results are very promising, and, and I think it, it's going to be uh, on the market in the next years, so perhaps we see these devices uh, once on, on, on CES as well, because with these devices you can, you can do a nice implanted Google Glass as well, in my opinion. That's going to last a, a bit longer. I think. Even uh, intelligent pills are a reality and used in science. I don't, I don't know if they, if they yet have a, uh, a market, but uh, you can really do a movie of your, of your uh, intestinal passage. That's really crazy, but, but that yet works. So coming to, to the last part of my of my talk, uh, I want to speak a bit about safety because uh, you saw that many systems here are built with uh, or connected with a smartphone and the smartphone obviously is no uh, medical device and that's uh, kind of a problem <coughs> talking about safety and uh, because there's a main difference between consumer electronics or and, and medical devices or the, the consumer electronics devices they have a much shorter time to market and, uh, much shorter product life cycle, so generally spoken, they are more instable than, uh, than medical systems. Um, I, I suppose there's nobody in that room that uh, wants to trust his life to, to, to his smartphone at this point. Me not. I don't know if, uh, if there's someone. And uh, the medical products, they have uh, yeah, two, two, main, uh, there are two main focuses when you do a, a FDA. Uh, you have to state that it's safe and you have to state that it's, it's, it's effective and definitely we, we don't do it like 50 years before with the first uh, pacemaker shown here. Uh, the first pacemaker they implanted that worked like one day and the second one that did not work at all and the third one worked like for three hours. So that's not the way we, we, we can do it today. So we have to meet some, some basic uh, requirements, that's clear, you have to do that with the consumer electronics as well. But you have to do a, a deep risk management uh, with, these, uh, with these devices and identify the product specific risks and, and yeah, tell, tell FDA how, how to, uh, to offend uh, these risks and to, to make it better. So that's, uh, that's a long way to go. And you have to do like pre-clinical clinical trials with your products, you have to do laboratory tests, uh, possibly you have to do animal trials uh, before uh, getting, getting into the market. You have to do clinical trials, uh, which is yeah, quite complicated to, uh, to do, quite expensive to do, especially for, for small companies. If you want to, uh, to get medical products to the market, that's going to be very, very expensive. <laughs> So uh, against that background, we, we asked ourselves uh, the question uh, that you can read here, is it possible to use consumer electronics products like smartphones in combination with medical equipment? And for sure the, the, the answer is not a clear yes or a clear no, and it uh, just depends uh, because the, the consumer electronics products, they have massive uh, advantages, like they are very cheap because they, they are in mass production. They have very nice standard interfaces like Bluetooth, like like uh, Zigbee or something, and uh, that's what we need to to, to use as uh, as when we want to do telemonitoring systems. For example, we cannot do our own uh, wireless standard that is not supported by the mobile phones, uh, for example. So, but we have to cope with this uh, small sometimes small, sometimes big disadvantages uh, that they are more instable because they have much shorter uh, product life cycles. 
So just to, to give an example about the, the complexity of, uh, of, uh, of the safety, uh, if you want to build a, a telemonitoring system, uh, you have to connect, in my opinion, you have to connect many, many devices. Just a system that is, is going to connect some devices with one operating system with one single island database is not going to be a breakthrough. There are going to be a breakthrough with the, with the telemedicine if you connect it really to the, to the healthcare system, uh, if you have a massive integration to the healthcare system. So if you want to build something like that, you, you have to, to support all the medical devices or nearly all the medical devices. And, and there are, additionally, there are many patients that consist on their device, on their company minimum that they trust on. You cannot uh, tell, for example, diabetic people, please switch to a complete other uh, company because sometimes they don't trust on these products. So you have many devices. You have many standards on, uh, on communication interfaces, for example, for wireless products. So despite there are standards, and the standards are good, but uh, it always differs how it's implemented in the hardware, for example. How, the, how it's implemented in the operating system. Then you have an unlimited uh, number of mobile phones with different hardware, different operating system, and, and actually you don't have any influence. If you, if you do a telemedical system, you don't have any influence about these phones. Uh, if the, the producer of the phone uh, decides to make an over the air update, it's just on the phone, and you have to cope with it that uh, it's, it's still working afterwards. And if you look uh, to, the, to the stability, it's just a uh, an example, it's, it's a bit old, it's three years old, but uh, it's, it's still like that. Uh, these are just uh, uh, numbers of crashes per app launch uh, on different operating systems. And on these times, uh, that was autumn uh, 2011, uh, both of these big uh, producers, uh, Apple and Google, they, they made major updates. And you can see if they make updates, the, the crashes per app launch are just going high. And if, if you look to the numbers, like, like 3% or something like that, these are not the numbers we can uh, we can cope with in medical devices, definitely not. So there are some more threats, especially for, for wireless devices. One is uh, data encryption, one is the data authorization that are yeah, definitely, as we see in the discussion at the moment, not, not really solved uh, at the moment. Even if, if we, we think that medical products sometimes last for 10, 15 years, if you have a pacemaker, for example, that's that going to be inside you for 10, 15 years and you never know what's, what about AES uh, 1024 in 15 years, nobody that is sitting here knows. You have to cope with these over-the-air updates, yet medical products use them. Uh, it's, it's quite safe, but uh, yeah, you, you always have a, a rest, of, rest of risk about them. And you have, uh, at last you have a, a threat of hacking. That is yet yet present. So that that uh, picture comes from from uh, a hacking event that was here in Las Vegas on the, the Black Hat Security Conference. There was a hacker just demonstrated to to get control over an insulin pump, over an automatic insulin pump that is normally connected to a to a measuring device. So the, the insulin uh, given by this pump is, is just automatically uh, controlled by that uh, by that measuring device. And he just got control over this insulin pump from, from meters away, so from the other side of the room, uh, which is kind of the perfect, uh, perfect murder uh, because you don't have to, to touch the person at all. So that's going to be a big threat. And if you think of implants, for example, that's going to be a big problem. Uh, and that's why many, many of these, uh, of these companies not at all uh, use, uh, use uh, life critical features on their, on their devices. So as a conclusion, uh, you can say the realization definitely is possible and, and it's, it's yet uh, done today. But uh, you need a high effort uh, to, make it, to make it safe, to meet the, the safety requirements. And uh, to date, I suppose that no, uh, no life critical features should be uh, included to these, uh, to these systems at the moment. Even uh, pacemaker producers, for example, they don't add life critical features in their wireless interfaces. At the moment, they don't do it at all. But at the end, uh, the good news is that uh, you just have always the same question: Does the benefit overbalance the risk? So, if the benefit is higher than the risk, you can use these 
uh, these systems. And uh, just as an, as an example, uh, every one of us, or nearly every one of us uh, sitting here is taking the risk of dying in a traffic accident every, nearly every day just for the benefit of the, of the personal individual mobility that we have from that. And that's, that's enough to do that. And dying from a from uh, traffic accident is much higher than, than dying from a dysfunction of a medical product. So that's the good news. So we can encourage everyone uh, to, uh, to do medical products because we, we just need them. So just coming to, to the end of my talk, we, I, I want to state that there are many, many, many systems like we saw on the, the CES as well. Uh, the many, many telemonitoring systems. If we just talk about telemonitoring, uh, that's the IEL system, that's our system. That, that is a system of, uh, of Telecom in Germany, for example, a system of Bosch there, but there are many, many, many more. But the problem is that are all island systems, so they are all separated from each other. They are not compatible with each other. We have some standards developing at the moment, like the continuous standard, but uh, that, it's, that, that does not help at the moment. It's possibly help in, in, in the future. And uh, there's no massive integration in the, in the healthcare system at the moment. And the whole infrastructure, like expert systems, uh, like databases, with, uh, with the knowledge databases, that is all missing at the moment. So in the moment, it's, it's just for personal monitoring. It's just for, for fitness uh, applications. Like we discussed in the, the panel in the discussion on Saturday as well, this, this big, big data aspect is, is completely missing at the moment. So it's just starting. Another problem is the, the reimbursement situation, especially in many countries in Europe. It's, it's different to the US, but in many countries in Europe, especially Germany, it's, it's, there's no reimbursement for, for telemedicine. And the people don't like to pay uh, on their own in Germany, for example. And the last uh, yeah, problem, I think, is, is the problem of acceptance. So I, I think we forgot a bit about the implications with these systems. I think, okay, there are many, many, many people surprising to me that are measuring their, their fitness values, their blood pressure, everything, and then uploading everything to Facebook. That's surprising to me. But people do it. But definitely these are not the people that we, we, we have to treat. There are many, many people that are going to have a heart attack in 20, uh, 30 years, and they will not do that voluntarily. Yeah, if you, if you take this as example with the, with the scale, for example, everyone has a, every household has a scale. With a scale, you don't need a, a smartphone, you don't need a, a database, you don't need a, a doctor. You can watch your your weight on your own. It's very easy. But do the people go less to McDonald's? No, obviously not. So that's that's going to be a problem. It's going to be, in my opinion, the, the main problem is the motivation. How do I get the people motivated to use these systems? And and let's see, uh, one possibility is that this comes with uh, kind of a pressure from the, from the health insurances. I hope not, but, but I think that's, uh, that's one, one possibility to come. So I want to end up with some, uh, some future trends, uh, which will come, which we saw in the CES gamification, for example, social networks, for example, that's going to be uh, go into healthcare a lot in the next, in the next years. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> I'll be open for your, for your questions, if there are some. We have time for just one or two questions. is the product liability 
issues which are inhibiting the deployment of some of the stuff. And I'm just wondering whether you've given any thought to technical solutions that would, uh, you know, create logs or evidence so that uh, in the event something is is charged, it can show, hey, okay, so it wasn't the fault of the device. Sorry, it wasn't. Liability. Yeah, can, can, can you build something into the into the device itself that, for example, does a monitoring or a log uh, that shows in the event somebody dies or gets hurt and it goes to court and the lawyers take it there, they can show that the manufacturer should not be held liable. Uh, thinking of a, of a technical solution to dealing with the product liability problem that's preventing a lot of this technology from coming to the market, particularly for stuff that's therapeutic or alarms. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I think you're right, but uh, but I, I don't think that the reliability problem is that high because you already uh, did that uh, while while FDA. You always have to do that risk analysis, and if you can show that, I don't know, uh, from 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 100 people, uh, one is dying, but you you save the life of 20 people, that's enough. So even if one is dying, that's that's the way you do it with medical products. It's not the same with the communication electronics, but clear when you mix it, you need that. Yeah, I think so. So, Dr. Dr. Kaus, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank you. It's a small uh, gesture of our appreciation for you.